Um, I want to move on to a new task related to semantics. Um, I don't have any special uh, announcements, but want to just check with you whether you have any questions about the project or the homework. Okay, I saw that you are quite active on Piazza, so just keep uh, keep asking questions. We will uh, be checking. Uh, next week, I mentioned uh, in an announcement last week that I'll be traveling, and um, I will I will send another announcement regarding that. I thought I will just teach remotely. I'm not sure whether that's going to be possible uh, for both of the uh, sessions. So uh, keep an eye for an announcement about the next week's uh, lectures. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, let's uh, let's move on with our uh, new topic. So last time we talked about uh, finding automatically uh, ways to extract who did what to whom, right? So we already talked about how knowing entities and how they are related to whatever action is going on in a sentence uh, is important and for what reasons. Um, but we were kind of stuck with just sentences, and usually we have longer pieces of text. And knowing who is being talked about in uh, in a piece of text is going to continue to be important, but now we'll have more than necessarily just a single entity uh, that is uh, included in the whole uh, text. So, for example, here we have Taylor and Morgan went to a conference uh, in Seattle. Uh, Taylor was uh, excited to unveil her research on mar marine biology, while Morgan was keen on discussing her innovations in renewable energy. At the conference, Taylor impressed the audience with her presentation, and Morgan formed valuable connections with industry lead leaders. In the evening, Taylor and Morgan went downtown and they enjoyed the jazz concert. So here we have two entities, uh, and uh, if we ask who presented uh, at the at the conference, we need to understand uh, who is um, um, excuse me. Uh, let's say the question is uh, who impressed the audience with her presentation. We need to understand because we have two references of her, uh, one referring to Morgan, another to Taylor. We need to understand what to to who uh, out of these two people this specific reference of her refers to. So we need to kind of understand what's going on with each one of these entities uh, in text and keep track of uh, their states and uh, keep updating them. And this is also known as a discourse model. This is a mental model that understander here, us who are reading this piece of text, are building incrementally when interpreting a text. And uh, this discourse model is going to contain a representation of entities referring to in text. Of course, Cartoonan in 1969, he didn't refer to representations alike we learn today, and he didn't use word representations in a way we are using them today when we talk about neural representations. It was not necessarily a vector representation, but you can definitely think about a model building implicitly a vector representation of an each of one of these entities and somehow changing the weights that appear in these uh, activations such that these weights capture all that has happened with these entities in text that we can retrieve with additional transformations of those vectors. So here representation means something broader than specific neural representations, but if your mind goes into thinking vector here, you wouldn't be necessarily wrong with making that intuition for yourself. And yeah, we have some kind of representational, mental representation of each one of these entities. And now we are building the properties of these entities. In the previous piece of text, now we have learned that uh, one of these people is a marine biologist. So whatever is our representation of that person, we will kind of assign, okay, uh, their profession is my marine bio biology. That's what we are doing. In the end, they went to see a jazz concert, so we can assume they, are li they like jazz music. So we kind of build more and more information in our mental representation of each one of these entities. Uh, this is what we refer to as a discourse model, but uh, when we say discourse, we mean something slightly different, uh, although super related, but here we, when we, when we use among each other discourse, we refer to a coherent structure group of sentences that make up language. Language is 
uh, not just a piece of scrambled text, right? Like we have learned about parsing and now we, uh, I think, have a better intuition after learning about all of that, that language is quite structured and you can't just put sentences as you as you wish. So if you have an advisor like me, they might say, well, your text needs to be more coherent uh, when you write. And this refers to the relationship between sentences that makes real discourses different than just random, you know, random assignments of uh, sentences. So uh, people, the, the term discourse is also a frequent term uh, in NLP. And um, we talked about syntax, semantics, and in uh, ACL and EMNLP, when you, pop, when you submit your papers to be peer reviewed, you can choose a track that's morphology, syntax, um, uh, discourse, and so on. They're kind of changing, especially with large language models. But just to be aware that this is, if you say uh, it's a discourse paper, people will immediately make a mental image of a paper that talks about whether the coherence of a piece of text is uh, truly uh, there or not. OK. Um, right. Um, I feel like I had something else to say uh, here, but it slipped my mind. OK, so um, today uh, we are going to uh, talk about how we can find uh, whether, OK, there is certain entity mentioned here, and these are all of the reference, all of the mentions all of these expressions in a piece of text refer to that same person or location or organization. Yes, please. Hi, I wonder if you have a smile posted. Sorry, second. Is there smiles posted? Uh, slides, are they posted? I honestly don't know. Did I link them to the website? Yeah, they're there. OK. If not, they're in the drive for sure. I just don't know whether I put them on the website, but it seems like I did. So can you open the drive? Yeah, yeah I'm found it. OK, great. Um, yeah, sorry about that. There is a lot going on this week, so uh, some of these things are uh, uh, slipping away from me. OK, so what I was saying is that we are going to find, like talk about the task where we are trying to find the uh, all the mentions to the same entities. And, um, and then we are going to see a neural approach to that task. But uh, first, we are going to introduce some linguistic terminology for all of this. So we are going to use the word, the term mentions to refer to any linguistic expressions like her, Taylor, Morgan, Taylor and Morgan, they. So basically pronouns and nominal noun phrases um, and um, references to, to, uh, to, to things like that. Um, Referent is going to be the discourse entity that is referred. So we have basically three entities here, Taylor, Morgan, and Taylor and Morgan. They Them together make a, a single entity as well. Um, so discourse entity, maybe there is a formal way to introduce it, but uh, the, the way I like to think about it, you are reading a piece of text and you are trying to, you are making this mental model of, okay, there is this person, this person, this group of people. So every single one of these individual actors or group of actors can uh, make a discourse entity. And then when you are writing a text, you are uh, referring to them in different ways. So uh, you can refer to them very often. We we use pronouns to refer to people, um, but it can also be later. I show I kind of extended this example where I added the. Maybe I can show it. Uh, just a moment. Here I I added this just to show you what else could be uh, a mention here. So. Uh, Taylor impressed the audience with her presentation as the 24-year-old. And 24-year-old is still a mention to the discourse entity Taylor. So it doesn't have to just be name or a pronoun. That's the point I'm trying to make. And then we say that two or more referring expressions uh, that are used to refer to the same discourse entity are, uh, uh, we, we say that they co-refer. Co so Taylor co-refers with her. Uh, Morgan also co-refers with another mention, her. Uh, and Taylor and Morgan are co-referring with uh, they. Because uh, her here refers to Taylor, her refers to Morgan, and they refer to Taylor and Morgan. OK, uh, so we have mentions. We have references, discourse entity. 
and the idea of entities co mentions of different entity uh, of the same entity co-referring with each other. There is also a term anaphora, which refers to uh, reference in a text to an entity that has been previously introduced in the discourse. Uh, so here, um, her is a reference to uh, an entity that has been previously introduced, and that's going to be Taylor over here. And therefore, her, we can call it anaphora. Um, a prior mention of the entity will be called antecedent. So if her is anaphora, Taylor is going to be antecedent to uh, her, to the anaphora her. And some entity will not have multiple mentions, and therefore they're going to be siglantones. OK, so we have learned about mentions, reference, uh, the idea of co-referring, uh, anaphora, antecedent, and uh, sing a singleton. And the task we are going to try to do is called co-reference resolution, where the task is to determine whether two mentions co-refer, meaning refer, as we just learned, to the same entity in the discourse model. And um, our goal is to build so-called co-reference chains or clusters. So for each one of the discourse entities, you will have that entity and all of its mentions. And that's going to form one co-reference chain or one co-reference cluster, however you like to call it. But you will have multiple entities, therefore you will have multiple chains and clusters. So you're going to have a set of chains or clusters as the output of co-reference resolution. So the output here, I extended the text to add just, I, when, when I was making slides, I realized, OK, all of my examples are either a proper noun or a pronoun. So you might mean, in your head, you might get an idea that that's the only thing that can be a mention. So I extended here, as I said before, uh, I added as the 24-year-old. And then the co-reference chain for the discourse entity Taylor is Taylor, her, the 24-year-old. Then we have Morgan and her, and Taylor and Morgan, I'm going to refer to they. Which means that here you have this so-called like embedded uh, mentions as well. And there, yeah, you might wonder whether we should now be including somehow some connection with Taylor. But uh, yeah, let's not get into that. And um, this actually compromises two subtasks. So the first task is to identify all the mentions. That would be basically all the phrases here that I kind of styled um, in, in something. So Taylor, Morgan, Taylor, her, Morgan, her, Taylor, her, the 24-year-old, Morgan, Taylor, and Morgan, and they. Those will be all of the mentions you want to uh, extract because these are all um, references to some discourse entities in this text. And this is easier task than then clustering them into co-reference chains, where you now need to decide which one of these, out of all of these mentions I have just mentioned, which one of them are to get should appear together and which uh, should not. And this is going to be a slightly harder task. OK, just want to stop here um, in case there are some questions about any of this terminology and whether the task itself is clear. Yes, please. Uh, yes, mention is any any expression in text here. Um, any any linguistic expression in text like her, Taylor, Morgan. Um, let me maybe bring um, another style, slide. <laughs> okay, so more formally, uh, it can be either a pronoun or name entity or a noun phrase. So any of these are usually mentions uh, to some entity uh, in text. And then referent is you have, um, as we said, discourse entity is something you kind of mentally imagine when you read a piece of text. We, you have learned that there are three entities in this text, Taylor Morgan and Taylor and Morgan. And uh, from there, you are uh, checking which uh, pronouns and which other noun phrases are referring to each one of these. So, uh, for example, let me see. So here, um, her is a reference to Taylor. So referent here is a phrase that refers to, uh, to another entity, a uh, discourse entity. Um, and then we kind of, um, it's a slight difference. Um, 
uh, here when we have anaphora, we also like this will be both referent and an anaphora. Um, because uh, her here refers to an entity that has been introduced before. Um, if we start with uh, here Taylor, this is not going to be uh, anaphora, for example. Okay, so the task is to find all dimensions and then group them into the clusters. Just like semantic role labeling, this is one of the core NLP uh, semantics related task, tasks. Uh, it has been um, mainstream for so many years uh, before the uh, necessity to extract linguistic structures became uh, less important with learned neural representations. Uh, think about any kind of NLP application that is done on more than a single sentence level. You need to know about coreference, which entities co-refer, because it's a key property of coherent language. If you would keep to use someone's name throughout the text, it would make a very strange text because usage of pronouns is so, um, you know, it's so normal in a text we wrote, write. So um, think about summarization. You want to summarize a text. Usually there are multiple things going on, multiple people, multiple locations, maybe some organizations. And we are gonna refer to each one of these with other, you know, other phrases. And you need to understand that all of those phrases refer to the same entity to be able to summarize text. If you have a dialogue, of course, you're gonna constantly be referring to the same thing in a different way. So to keep track of the dialogue as well, you need to uh, do co-reference resolution. Every single task you can imagine that's beyond the sentence le sentence, single sentence level requires co-reference resolution. And therefore it was a core core tasks for many uh, applications if we had, and it still is if we try to do, approach this application in a more pipeline way where we do this uh, linguistic uh, structures first and then give these structures as an input to a model that then learns from these manually designed features. Um, you know, neural approaches are not, that this is not necessary for your pre-trained language model to summarize text anymore. Um, but as I said, for other languages, uh, you might still need to use linguistic structures. And also for certain, still many companies today are not deploying pre-trained language models to do some of these NLP tasks because with these linguistic structure, you have more control over what is happening. And companies do like that level of control to understand where the failure modes are. And if you can say, well, the failure of our pipeline is because our syntactic parser isn't uh, good enough in these special cases, you know, an engineer can may fix that uh, one specific thing, right? Where with printing language models, it's still very much open-ended. How do we find these failure modes? Um, and therefore we have a whole course on just that one job, okay? So yeah, super, super important task or reference resolution. Um, there are multiple related tasks to co-reference resolution, and I will go over each one of them just to introduce them uh, before we go into how we can actually model, how we can build uh, an NLP tool for doing co-reference resolution. So this is now slight digression into related co-reference resolution tasks. Um, so we said that two mentions co refer if they are associated with the same uh, discourse entity. And very often people will want to know, maybe these are not fictional characters and very often with NLP applications, there are not. So you might be interested in to which world, actually like world, real world entity, this uh, reference, this mention refers to. Um, so if you had a text about uh, certain, I don't know, politicians, you might want to know more about what kind of knowledge we have about these people and uh, to then, you know, enrich your understanding of this piece of text. Uh, and this task is called entity linking, uh, usually done by mapping to an ontology, which is a list of entities in the real world. So before where I had Taylor and Morgan, you wouldn't just uh, stop with, okay, these are uh, all the reference of Taylor and Morgan in this text. You would also be 
linking them to specific people in the real world if these were specific people in the real world. All right, so if I say, okay, we are gonna link to some list of entities in the real world, which resource comes to your mind? Yeah, right, Wikipedia has a bunch of people uh, um, listed in the uh, Wikipedia. Um, so um, this is commonly, entity linking is commonly done by linking to Wikipedia page. So you have a piece of text and you do the whole thing with co-reference, you find all the mentions and you say, these are the, we are, these are the groups of the same people. Um, and then you would also link that cluster to a Wikipedia page of that uh, person. Okay. Um, any questions about entity linking? As I said, I will just go slide by slide over different versions of tasks that are related co to co-reference just to introduce you to them. And then we'll go back to co-reference. But so it's gonna be a little bit like me moving to a next thing, which is completely unrelated, seemingly. Um, so stop me if you have any, any questions. Okay, so another co-reference related challenge, a so-called Vinograd schema challenge, which are named by Terry Vinograd, who, uh, I mean, he, he's just this one of these amazing researchers. I, I really recommend checking out the podcast episode from The Gradient, where he talks about his whole uh, journey. He started with in this symbolic AI and he introduced these challenges and then he lost hope that this will ever be uh, achieved. And he said, I'm done with this AI thing. I'm going to he was at the Stanford at the time as a professor, and he said, I'm going to start HCI at Stanford. So he was the person who started HCI uh, at Stanford there and has a bunch, bunch of interesting things to, to say, not about just research, but about a life of a researcher. Um, so we know the uh, schema challenge required you to do co-reference with um, also common sense knowledge. Like you need to be able to uh, to understand you can understand these uh, these sentences. You should be understanding them only if you have uh, not only co-reference abilities, but also common sense knowledge. So here is an example of the city council denied the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence or uh, they advocated violence. Can you tell me which one of these uh, options is a correct interpretation? Yes, please. All right, let me see how they are ambiguous. The city council denied the demonstrators a permit because I see they okay, yeah. This is an example where it can be either one of these things. It can be they can refer to the city council because they uh, they are fearing that the demonstrators are going to do uh, violent things, so they denied it, or um, uh, the demonstrator adv really advocated for violence, and therefore they uh, denied them a permit. Okay, so yeah, this is unfortunate that I brought this example. Um, um, let me find a more standard one. Um, Um, I have no idea where I am. All right, so, okay, so this is more common example. Uh, the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. Uh, and then the question was, uh, what was too big, uh, the trophy or the suitcase? So what the right answer is here, trophy, right? So uh, because we are not going to try to fit the suitcase in a in a trophy, right? Um, so anyway, this is now a little bit anti-chromatic Vinograd scrim. <laughs> uh, they are more, more exciting than the way I present them. But the point uh, is that you have the, you need to um, find what the pronoun is referring to. And you have basically two options here. And then you're using your common sense knowledge 
uh, something that's outside of this exact sentence to uh, determine what the pronoun is actually referring to. And at the time, they were they were taught to be, you know, uh, Google proof because you common sense uh, people. We, we we all have common sense understanding, but we don't uh, need to say it out loud. That's why it's common sense, right? You just assume other person will understand that something um, uh, has a certain size, and therefore we can't do something with it. We can't fit a suitcase into a trophy. We just not something we are doing. Um. Uh, so for a while they they uh, you know you because we don't write. Uh, common sense uh, information out loud. We don't say them, we don't write them. They were taught as Google proof because you can't find these uh, simple statistical associations between um, information you need to do this task right. And therefore people have even gone as far to be suggesting it as alternative to uh, you know proof of uh, whether AI models can reason and understand. Uh, interestingly, on the topic of reasoning and whether, you know, uh, whether uh, these models know uh, about the meaning of all of these things, uh, I, re I strongly recommend this blog post by Julian Michael on this whole, whole thing. It's enormous. So, yeah, you will probably need, you know, break it up in a couple of days. Uh, but uh, here I, I want to highlight this snippet uh, because now I'm talking about can these uh, Vinograd um, schema challenges be used as a as a way to show that the models um, reason and understand. And they, it, it has been shown that no, it cannot because we found that the models can exploit those data shortcuts that some of you are exploring in your uh, excuse me project. Um, so it turned out, no, the answer is no. But even at the time, like decades ago, when they asked one of the uh, uh, one of the quarters of Vinokara uh, schema challenges, uh, what does she uh, think about what should we make of it if a statistical learning system passes the WSC? And instead of replying, then such a system must have common sense knowledge. She said, then the WSC is not the test we thought it was, which is really ahead of, ahead of its time. Really, really fun uh, fun fact uh, here. Um, so yeah, Vinograd schema challenge related to coreference, also thought to be a, you know a way to test whether AI models can reason. Uh, and today we know that that's not sufficient test because models can exploit. It's still not Google proof, basically, uh, and and there therefore the question of whether people reason and understand is hard, and people are still very much so looking into how to do that. Okay, so that was a total digression. Now, uh, going back into related uh, tasks to coreference, um, the the way I introduced coreference mentions were either pronouns or proper names or noun phrases. However, you can also have uh, references to so-called events, which can be also verbs. Uh, event, uh, if you want to annoy an NLPer, ask them to define what an event is, because that seems to be a huge, uh, you know, like a massive disagreement of what constitutes an event. Uh, but you can, uh, so it's hard, hard to define precisely, but you can think of it as any expression denoting what you deem to be an event, like something happening, or state that can be assigned to a particular point uh, or interval in time. Uh, so for example, here we have two events, buying and acquisition. The text says MD agreed to buy Markham Ontario-based ATI for around 5.4 billion in cash and stock. Uh, the companies announced Monday, the acquisition would turn MD into one of the world's largest providers of graphical uh, graphics chips. So here the task is invent a uh, coreference deciding whether two events mentioned refer to the same uh, event. Uh, and detecting, uh, again, we have two subtasks, uh, the, uh, finding all the mentions of events and then deciding whether they co-refer or not. And deciding whether something is an event is way harder because definition is just, um, it, it, you can think of gazillion edge cases basically is the issue. But the examples here are buying uh, and acquisition. And then the, we, we get into more funky territory. So bridging is a very, very uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. So 
Bridging refers to non-identical semantic or encyclopedic uh, relationships between anaphoric noun phrases, which we call bridging anaphors, and their antecedents. So give me, let me give you an example. Here we have, in June, farmers held on to meat, milk, and grain, waiting for July's usual state-directed price rises, the communist price prices instead. And here we have uh, prices being uh, whatever uh, being the uh, bridging anaphor, and its antecedents are meat, milk, and grain. Although meat, milk, and grain and prices are not the same discourse entity, they are related. When we say that the um, usual, uh, usual state-directed price rises, we know that price rises here refers to uh, rising prices of meat, milk, and uh, grain. So there are these uh, implicit links between these uh, phrases and their potential antecedent. And the idea is to, again, to kind of connect prices to meat, milk, and grain, which really helps with a uh, really fine-grained understanding of what is related to what, and um, uh, which is actually needed for a proper understanding of, of text. And then uh, there is a so-called discourse dikesis or abstract, indirect, or complex anaphora. And this is actually something I worked on, on during my uh, PhD. Uh, this is the, here anaphors do not need to refer to actually pronouns, noun phrases, or proper nouns. Uh, they can be having antecedents, which we call non-nomial. So it can be anything that's not a noun phrase. And this is often happens uh, in texts where we refer to some Anything that's proposition like entity, so like a fact or event or properties, and in that sense is abstract because instead of having a person you can imagine or organization that actually exists or location you know of, you have something that's abstract. It's like a fact or something that's uh, not you know visible or you can't shape it in a physical form. So here an example of this um, is. Uh, the guys that made traditional hardware are really being obsoleted by microprocessor-based machines, said Mr. Benton. And as a result of this trend, so this trend is referring to this whole idea of uh, people, um, uh, the guys who are making traditional hardware being obsessed with microprocessor-based machines. Um, this is super useful when you want to, if, if there is some kind of, uh, if this pronoun, this re is now in, included in some kind of opinion and expression, you can kind of trace back, okay, this is what this person thinks about the other person, only if you know what this uh, pronoun this refers to. So it enables you to understand the relationship between entities if you are able to point to, uh, you know, uh, pieces of text that happened uh, before the pronoun. Okay. Um, so, all, I guess I wanted to first of all introduce you to all these different versions of coreference resolution. And as you can see, it's quite complex, the phenomena revolving around discourse, right? Like there is so many things that need to be uh, implicitly or explicitly connected to each other to truly understand text. So um, yeah, today we don't maybe uh, do all of these things in a, in a way that's super explicit. We don't necessarily extract every single one of these, which makes it even so more impressive that when you now ask a pre-trained language model to summarize a text and it gives you a good summary, um, which is written in its, you know, not by extracting information that's already in the document, but rather in a more free from form way, it's kind of impressive that all these uh, phenomena are kind of a seemingly handled uh, on its own. Okay, um, so I'm gonna move into how we are gonna actually model coreference uh, resolution. So um, any questions about anything I said so far? Very well, okay. So just a reminder that the uh, coreference resolution uh, consists of two subtasks. The first subtask is to find all possible mentions. And then the second subtask is to decide which of one of them corifer, uh, corifer. So the first subtask mention detection, what we are giving um, is some piece of text. And we usually have three kinds of mentions, pronouns, named entities, or noun phrases. 
Um, and so um, how we could extract these? Um, first idea, maybe, okay, if I say these are possible mentions, what, how we can uh, extract mention candidates? We have learned now after the spring break, a couple of techniques. So for example, how can we find all pronouns in text? Exactly, part of speech tagging gives us pronouns. How can we find named entities? Mm -hmm. Named entity recognition and noun phrases. Parsing. Constituency parsing, exactly. Um, we probably might do something with dependency parsing, but uh, constituency really gives us noun phrases uh, directly. So great, we have now learned a bunch of techniques and if we, uh, if we would need to do everything in a pipeline way, we would apply those uh, methods we have learned and we would get a bunch of pronouns, named entities and noun phrases, and each one of these are our potential um, candidates for uh, mentions. However, you know, um, we will over generate the mentions uh, in this fashion because not every pronoun, named entity, and noun phrase is uh, is a mention. So for example, these are some examples. Uh, it is sunny. If you if you meet your friend and you just say, oh, it's sunny, you are not referring to it being something, anything. It's just expression you are saying, right? Uh, if I say every student, then again, this is not a reference to a specific entity. This is just to say all, all students or no students as well, it doesn't refer to any entity. Now, you might say the best donut in the world, and uh, you can use it to refer to a specific donut. Uh, you, you might say, oh, I, I was going, I was in downtown, I tried this shop and I ate the, uh, I ate a donut and this was the best donut in the world. This would be, that would be a co-reference there between these two mentions of donuts. Uh, but if you just say, I'm looking for the best donut in the world, this is not a this is not a mention of a specific entity because you don't ha don't know what his best donut is uh, yet. Uh, also, quantities. If you have hundred miles, this is going to be a noun phrase. This is not going to be entity. This is just quantity, right? So, one idea we could do is to uh, over generate these mentions and and then train a classifier. Um, to decide whether something is really a mention or not from a set of candidates' uh, mentions. Or we can keep them all as candidates, then run our, you know, algorithm for uh, putting the clustering them, and then some of them won't co-refer with anything and we'll discard them. Um, and we will say these are not mentions of something that co-refers with anything else in text. So these are these are the options we can do. All right, so we can do this for mention detection. How exactly are we gonna then decide which mentions are uh, co-referring or not? And for that, it's uh, as we have seen with many, many things in this course, we are gonna use supervised machine learning. Um, there have been rule-based systems for this. Uh, if you've heard about Hobbes algorithm, it has been uh, used as a rule-based system for co-reference resolution. We won't talk about the rule-based systems. Um, and if we are gonna approach something with supervised machine learning, we do need the labeled data, right? So common data for, um, for co-reference resolution comes from this resource called Ontonotes. It's again, one of these classic resources for NLP research similar to Pantry Bank. And um, in NLP, there are, among when we organize conferences, uh, some folks will organize so-called shared tasks where you are given um, a problem and you're given data for the problem and a leaderboard. And the goal is to be the best at this uh, leaderboard. So there is a bunch of shared tasks related to NLP conferences. Connell is a conference that is collocated with the standard NLP conferences like ACL or EMNLP. And in 
2012, there was a shared task that was created specifically for care reference resolution, where they provided uh, this autonomous data, but in a specific format. So if you see Connell 12 shared task version of, of um, for co reference resolution, that's autonomous data just formatted differently. Okay, and we are now gonna see two ways to approaching um, um, co reference resolution with um, uh, supervised machine learning, with the ultimate goal to showing you a neural uh, approach uh, for, for this. Okay, so the first way to approach this is by using the mentioned pair model. Here, uh, input is gonna be a pair of mentioned. One is a candidate anaphora. And as we have learned, anaphora means that this is an expression that has, it is referring to an entity that has already been introduced previously. And here we are going to have uh, another uh, mention that's going to be a candidate antecedent. So uh, whatever it has appeared uh, before this anaphora uh, that is potentially co-referring. And output is going to be a binary decision whether these two mentions co-refer or not. So this means if we are gonna uh, you know, build, for example, a classifier, this means we need some data. We need to have positive examples, meaning pairs of mentions that do co-refer and pairs of, example, uh, of mentions that do not co-refer as our negative examples. Um, and you could choose all of the, you know, uh, you, you extract all mentions or, you know, you have them in your training data. And then you would say, well, things that actually co-refer are going to be my positive examples and everything else, all other pairs of mentions are going to be negative examples. But this will uh, result in having way more negative uh, examples than positive examples. So you don't want that because you will have one class being way more uh, represented. And that usually means that the model will be biased to predicting that class, to saying that things do not co-refer. So you, you can always change the loss function to kind of circumvent that, but the easiest way is to filter out some of your negative examples, some of these mentions that do not co-refer. And very common heuristic is to choose the closest antecedent as positive example, um, and all pairs in between as negative uh, examples, not every single other uh, mention uh, and that anaphore as the uh, negative example. And then if you're building a classifier, we now have data, we need to start with some kind of representations. As with semantic row labeling, here we would, before the neural approaches, we would have a bunch of handcrafted uh, features. And that would be the input to our model. And we might apply something we learned in the first few lectures like logistic regression or perceptron. Uh, but then with neural representation, um, what is going to be our representation uh, as we have seen with semantic role labeling? So the question is, if we are uh, going to use a neural model to uh, decide whether two mentions are, are co-referent or not, and let's say we are just looking at features of those two uh, expressions, what kind of uh, representation are we going to use with neural models? What did we use for SRL as the, uh, as the input for a neural SRL model? So last time when we talked about uh, semantic role labeling, we have seen a neural approach to semantic role labeling and we have given a sentence and then each one of these tokens was represented in some way. Um, what was the way we represented them? With a neural approach. So we didn't use part of speech for neural. Give me anything. Embeddings. Embeddings. And we gave an example, right? For example, glove, right? Yeah, that's correct. So with neural methods, because the idea is to, you know, avoid any kind of manual, uh, you know, design of features, 
and to decide like before we had to say, okay, this is a part of speech or whatever. We now want to have everything to be in the end-to-end -end fashion and represent words with uh, embeddings. And before pre-trained language models, we would use pre-trained word embeddings like word to work or glove. But uh, then with pre-trained language models, we would just put the sentence, tokenized sentence into BERT and whatever is the first embedding layer of BERT would be uh, the representation of the input. So with neural methods, we are using uh, representation learning. When representations of tokens are learned in a data-driven fashion, rather than us deciding what's important. Okay, any questions? What's input, output? What are we, what can we do here? Okay, so, um, all right, let's talk about inference. We have trained a model that can decide whether for two mentions, such as here, Victoria Chen and she, whether they are co-referring or not. So the model, uh, let's say uh, first one, so let, let's say we are building a super simple uh, glove, uh, glove uh, based um, neural network. Uh, we have mentioned one and we have mentioned two. One mention is Victoria Chen and the other one is she. Um, we want to decide whether they co-refer or not. So because Victoria Chen is a multi-word expression, we are going to average the word embeddings of Victoria with the word embedding of Chen. And that's going to represent the word, um, that's going to be the word representation of Victoria Chen. And then we have other uh, and, uh, mention she, we'll just word, use the glove uh, embedding for she. Uh, now we have two vectors. We can, let, let's try to brainstorm a little neural network. What we can do now, if we want to decide that whether these two vectors should be classified as yes, you co-refer or not. There are multiple ways to go about this. Just throw some idea how, like now you have built two vectors and the one vector represents one span of text, the other represents the other, and you just want to build a classifier to, that says whether they co-refer or not. So let's say I don't wanna include any additional features. Now, I mean, just interested, what are the subsequent uh, layers of neural networks that you would introduce to be able to get a prediction at the end? Can we just make a binary classifier? Like, yes, these words go there, but are they then? Yes, go? that's what we are at, but I'm interested in details of that classifier that uh, you are imagining. And I'm specifically interested if you are want to build a neural classifier, any kind of neural classifier. And you have um, not any, because I said I, I, I gave you this glove representations of these two spans. And what can you do now? Yes, please. That product between uh, two of them, and then we get some number. Well, we could do that, but that's not. Uh, we are no, we have no weights here, right? That's just um, decide. That's cosine similarity, between, but which is a great baseline, like a great way to just see. I, I don't think like you will have a bunch of references. Pronouns themselves don't. You know, they can refer to different things. So that I don't expect to work real well. So. If we are building a neural network on top of this, we need to have some transformations. So I'm interested in how, how, how are you gonna, what are you gonna do? <laughs> I, you, you can do this. It's, it's uh... like a simple perception, like a linear information followed by some long Okay, and that's that's fine, but how, in, we have two vectors, right? So you, you're, you're suggesting linear transformation, which means that I need to multiply a matrix with a vector, but I have two vectors. So what do I do? Didn't you all implement a deep averaging network for your homework too? You had multiple vectors, right? And you average them, and then you got one vector that represents the input and then you did the linear, nonlinear transformation. So this is something we can do here as well. We have now glove representation of Victoria Chen, glove representation of she. Uh, we could maybe sum them. We can average them. 
we can concatenate them, then we have larger metrics that we need. But the point is that whenever you have multiple uh, vectors, uh, then um, either you are going to opt out for if you are stuck with the, you know, pre pre transformer or pre recurrent neural networks, you are you you do need all you like your neural network consists of just matrices, so the input has to be a vector, right? And if you have multiple words, multiple vectors, you need to combine them into single vector to be able to multiply them with the matrix. Uh, it would be an overkill, but you could, um, if you have transformer-based architecture and you have Victoria Chen and Xi, you could, you know, um, learn, uh, represent Victoria Chen and Xi with an individual tokens, do the self-attention thing and so on. In the end, uh, you will still get three, you know, three token representation for these three tokens you had in the input. And you still need to combine them in some way to be able to multiply that final combination with the output metrics, which gives you a probability for co-referring or not co-referring. So yeah, um, I think because it seems like this is not didn't really land for you. These are things you should be more confident about, right? Like you should be having better impressions of if I have these pieces of text and I want to approach this with the neural architecture before pre-trained language models, I just want to use GLAV or word to vec how, what, what do I do with these pieces of uh, information? How do I combine them into a vector representation and then uh, multiply in the uh, subsequent steps? Yes. Uh, if, uh, if you are going to take a transformer based approach, mm -hmm. uh, transformers are usually sequence to sequence transform. Yeah. So, uh, and when we saw, um, not not necessarily, right? Uh, sorry, I, I I just went along and said uh, yes, but um, you don't need like transformer and sequence to sequence are not synonyms, right? And the original transformer is introduced as encoder decoder, but then we have seen all these other versions encoder only decoder only. So you do not need to uh, approach this in a sequence to sequence fashion. When we uh, talked about how we can use transformers for classification, mm -hmm. uh, we said that you can treat it as a sequence to sequence model where mm -hmm. you can take the word positive or negative instead. Yeah. So we can do the same thing here. Mm -hmm. that, uh, yes, these are co-referring or not co-referring. Exactly. But how would that give us the probability? It would just be a classic sample. Yeah. So yeah, remember. Softmax is always the last thing before we actually display anything. And softmax contains probabilities. If you did approach this in generative setup, which you can, which is great that you remembered, uh, you would have probability. It would just be, you would have the probability of the over the entire um, vocabulary instead of these two options. So what people can also do when they have distribution over or vocabulary, which is, let's say, uh, 30,000 dimensional, but they are interested only in two values, uh, refer, uh, co-refer or not co-refer uh, will be associated with only two values in this uh, enormous uh, probability vector. So you can check only those and ignore everything else and see which one is higher than the other. Mm -hmm. the, value, the difference might be smaller than what you would see if you had only two right uh, dimensional softmax layer. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So again, would be a total of kill to uh, now also approach this in a generative fashion. But um, this is kind of what we are doing with LOP these days. It's all all of it is kind of overkill. Um, okay, so I'm making a mental note that how to do neural mo like how to design neural models didn't really land. So uh, keep thinking about this. And especially when I think about designing an exam, this is a good uh, thing for me to remember to check whether you, you can, uh, you know, if I tell you design me a model that you can uh, write what's the next layer after whatever kind of input I had given you. All right, so um, kind of, Again, I digressed a little bit just to see how you can, can you imagine what kind of classifiers we can build here. Um, and uh, the reason why I wanted to mention this uh, and ask you this is, okay, now we train this classifier. Uh, we have representation of Victoria Chen, we have representation of she. 
And let's say I concatenated these two. And now I have, let's say the initial representation were 300 dimensional. Now I have 600 dimensional vector. So, and I just, I will just do linear transformation plus one non-linearity and then output layer. So uh, in the end I get, let's say my hidden size of my transformation is 400. What I will get as the output of my nonlinear transformation is 400 dimensional vector, which represents these pairs right now. And then uh, after that, I'm interested only in uh, whether they correfer or not. So I will have four time, 400 times two dimensional matrix, which will give me a vector of two dimensions. And each one of these dimensions refers to, let's say first dimension refers to coreferring, the other the, uh, refers to not coreferring. And then whatever is higher, uh, we can uh, say is um, coreferring um, or not. But also you can have just the score. You can, you don't need to have two classes. You can say, well, um, I'm just interested in a single uh, value that will tell me uh, the likelihood of whether these are co-referring or not. And sometimes people do that, but then at the inference time, you need to decide what's the threshold. And, you know, very often we'll choose 0.5, having this intuition, as, as I said, like the alternative is not co-referring. So if you're above 0.5, then yeah, you, you would predict they are co-referring. All right. So um, at inference time, that's what we would do if we didn't have uh, two-dimensional uh, output uh, vector. And besides that, we would also do something which is called transitive closure. So imagine that the model predicts the relation between she and the 37-year-old. And the model also predicts that she and Victoria Chen are co-referring. Now, the model did not predict that the 37-year-old and Victoria Chen are co-referring. But we would, in a post-processing post post step, say, well, if she co-refers with this, uh, the 37-year-old, and if she co-refers Victoria Chen, then Victoria Chen and the 37-year-old must co-refer as well. And this is called transitive closure. OK, so this was the mention, uh, mention pair model. Moving on to mention ranking model, and then we will see neural mention uh, ranking model. So the idea between behind uh, mention ranking model is that uh, we are going to approach the coreference by deciding whether an it mention, um, so some anaphor, whether uh, uh, what is the um, the highest. Uh, oh, excuse me. I will give you an anaphor to the model and all possible candidate antecedents. And I will ask the model to give me the highest possible uh, or highest scoring antecedent from uh, all possibilities. And in that sense, it's ranking because you, the model needs to rank these antecedents to decide which one is the highest ranked one. Um, so the data will be a mention and one of the gold uh, antecedents, not all of them, because we are interested only in finding the the high scoring one now it's a bit weird because our data doesn't have a notion of the high scoring antecedent because it's a made up concept right so here we need to choose what is going to be our artificial high scoring antecedent for training and people very often chose choose the closest one um and then at the uh, inference time you will get one antecedent for each an anaphor and because of transitive closure, you will get the full cluster. <clears throat> so that's the idea behind mentioned ranking method. And this is the method that has then been embraced for the neural mentioned ranking model. And this was the first end-to-end -end coreference model that kind of, again, similar to semantic role labeling, gave boosts and then additional boost happens from pre-trained model, and this uh, has been work. These kinds of models had for English work way better than approaches that were before them. Yes. Uh, it that the board was assigned uh, using some strategy that they do this mm -hmm. and Is this self supervised? Uh, no, no, no. It's not. It's not. Uh, so uh, let me clarify this. You have in your kernel shared task data. You have um, information of which what are the coreference clusters. 
Uh, but the idea that one antecedent is better than the other, that that's, you know, it's irrelevant in a way. Like it's, um, all of them are equally important to each other because the information that we're interested in, are they co-referring or not? There isn't the notion of one of these entities co-referring more than the other. So this is just for the, introduced for the model to learn that amongst all of these possible antecedents, which some of which are not antecedents of the sana uh, one of them is certainly an antecedent, right? And then uh, you do that and have this transitive closure that kind of puts all of these connections together in a, in a cluster. Yeah, so, um, and, and when I said we need to choose one, um, you could choose the closest one or you can find another heuristic that you will deem is a, is a better fitting here. Okay, so uh, with a neural mention ranking algorithm, we are gonna have a fully end-to-end -end approach. So we are going to start with a sequence of tokens and con consider all subsequences as, as possible mentions. Now, um, all subsequences is actually a slight lie here because we will uh, kind of bound them by how long they can be. And very often uh, people choose uh, subsequences of the maximally 10 tokens, not all possible sequences. And um, when we say end to end, this means that we are not gonna have a pipeline where we first find the mentions and then the separate model, separate component is gonna do the coreference chaining. Rather, the model will do everything jointly. So the model gets a sequence of tokens. Um, okay, not um, it like we will do the the uh, process of finding substrings up to the length of ten tokens, and this will be all possible candidate mentions. Then the model will decide which one of these are actually mentions and then pass that information to its subsequent layers. And then the subsequent layers are is gonna decide uh, whether uh, certain mentions co-refer or not. And then we'll have loss on the mention detection part, the loss on co-reference uh, chaining part. We are going to put these losses together and that's gonna be the final loss that back propagates through all the layers the ones that make uh, decisions whether to mention score refer or not, as well as the layers that decide whether something is a mention or not. Okay, so that's the overall uh, picture. And now we're gonna go into, into how this works. So this is your another opportunity to think about how we can design uh, neural architectures. Okay. Um, so, the first part is to decide whether um, something is a mention or not. So here we need to do a couple of things. We first have our text. Here text is a uh, general electric said the postal service contacted the company. That's gonna be placed into uh, an architecture and um, it doesn't matter which one, uh, it can be a transformer. You can imagine this is a transformer encoder. And after 12 layers, 12 encoder blocks, you have a, now a contextualized representation of each one of these words. This would be the output of the final layer of a transformer encoder, for example. Okay, now, as we talked just a moment ago, when I asked you, hey, what can we do about, uh, you know, how can we decide whether, um, uh, you know, how we can, can we do the mention detection? Then we said, okay, maybe we can concatenate them and do some non-linear transformation. So here, um, the model considers um, uh, all, as, as I said, subsequences to be potential, um, potential mentions. And to do that, you need to combine the representations of individual tokens. Here, this visualization shows you only if you are combining uh, uh, basically when you are creating bigrams and trigrams here. So let's go over this um, a little bit slowly, but just remember that here in this visualizations, 
potential mentions are only bigrams or trigrams, but in actual implementation, it can be in up to 10 grams. It's just very hard to now visualize how we could combine uh, representations up to the that length. So here we have a general and a representation of a general. And let's say that's the contextualized representation we get from the final uh, layer of the encoder transformer. And we have a representation of uh, electric. And here we are gonna learn the span representation for general electric by combining representation of general, representation of electric, and here they also introduce this called span head. That's the idea that if you have a span, as we've seen with dependency parsing, one of these words is more kind of like central to the phrase, right? So if you have a noun phrase, uh, such as, um, I don't know, uh, a happy cat, cat is that central word because, word because happy modifies cat. And you can kind of extend this notion to other phrases. So they want to have, they deem that one of the words in the phrase is the most important and they want to find the representation of that phrase. But they do not have information of what that word exactly is. So what they do is they use the uh, attention. Basically they have um, the uh, these three, let's say here, if you are building representation of electric said the, um, and you, uh, you deem in electric said the, that word may be electric. Maybe that one is the most important. As you can see, there isn't really strong notion of what the head word is here. So maybe electric and said are equally important, but the is a little bit less important. So what you do is you use your attention and here you have three vectors. Then you learn, as we have learned it, uh, how to do that. Um, you find a way to uh, get important scores for each one of these. Uh, and then for each one of these has some weight assigned to it. And all these three weights sum to one. And then uh, you can learn a new representation where you take the um, average, weighted average of these three representation where the averages come from the attention and have notion of importance. So span head here, basically what it does, it learns a new representation of these two or three words where uh, the there is um, this new representation is um, constructed by taking the uh, average of the individual token representations, but uh, there are weights assigned to each token representation depending how important the model thinks each one of these token is to this phrase. So that's what span head does. Yes. And that implies the weights are also your uh, yes, yeah, definitely. So whatever to to do the like attention part, you have some extra weights, and those weights are gonna be learned. So yeah, we don't introduce ourselves a notion of what is an important, you know, important word in a given phrase. Rather, we let the model to decide what it is. So that's gonna be span head here. That's that's what span head does. Learns a new representation of a given sequence of tokens where it gives more weight to certain tokens. And then in the end here, the span representation is gonna be combined by concatenating all these representations. So you take the representation of general, representation of electric, you take the representation that's uh, learned by the span head and you concatenate them all together. You might be even doing extra things and just enriching this uh, representation. Um, the point is, and that's something that didn't really come to you immediately when I asked you this before, is that from two words or from three words, you need to end up with a single vector. You need to combine them in some fashion, right? And here, let's say we are concatenating the representation of general, representation of electric together with the representation we get from the span head. All right. So now for each one of the bigrams, for each one of the consecutive, uh, to, uh, uh, excuse me, for each trigram in this sequence, we get a single vector representation. And we are interested to know whether each one of these should be a mention or not, right? So what do we do here? At top of each one of these pen representations,
what do we need to say whether a span is going to be a mention or not? We need what? Yeah, so um, I would say just linear transformation because you just need the output transformation which turns the span into either a score that tells you the likelihood of this being a span. So here, if this is, let's say, um, 900 dimensional vector, we will multiply this with the 900 dimension uh, with a matrix of the size 900 times uh, either one or two, depending of whether you want to have also probability of not being a mention or you're just interested in the probability of being a mention. In here, they are just interested in one probability. So we are actually doing the uh, product with the nine. 900 dimensional weight vector and we are going to get a single number which tells us whether this is basically the score the likelihood of this span being a mention or not okay so for you see how here we have general electric and then above this single number we have general electric then here electric said the electric said the is the uh, the phrase that is associated with this number and so on Okay, I want to stop here and see, are there any questions or confusions about what we have done here? Let's try to nail this down. Like it's a, it's important to know how, you know, even with pre-trained models, you still need to understand if you have certain input and you're interested in, you know, you're not interested to make a prediction at the, you know, full sentence level, rather at the expense, you know, um, how you could go about it. So this is still very relevant for you to know. So I want to make sure that you you kind of understand how we went from a full text into representations of span and then single number that tells us whether it's mentioned or not. Okay. Oh yes. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear the example you gave. Twenty words. Yeah. So it, it's a it's a choice for your model. Here they set it to be looking only at the spans of the length ten, and if you had a span that is a mention but is above length ten you would not capture it as a mention, and that would be the error of your model. Uh, I don't know exactly how they decided with 10. I suppose that longer than 10 doesn't occur very often, so you don't want that extra complexity if you are going to miss very few cases. And when you think about it, it's it's very hard to even imagine like super gigantic uh, mention of, a, of an, an entity. With, uh, you know, here we are talking about coreference, so our entities are noun phrases, pronouns, proper names, not those abstract anaphors I was talking uh, for a brief moment. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just wondering why you use the Yes, here, um, after this. So maybe I should uh, clarify. You could do a more nonlinear transformation of your span representation if you are interested to have even more nonlinear representation of your span. Uh, but um, what is more important for the point I was trying to make is that once you have whatever span representation you are happy with, you need to make uh, what you are interested in finally is knowing whether that's a mention or not. So there, for that, we just need a linear transformation because output layers are, if you don't think about softmax as, uh, you know, ignoring softmax, the only thing you do is the linear transformation into number of classes you have and that's it, right? With applying the softmax, which is now a realized nonlinearity, and that might be also a point of uh, confusion uh, or misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, when I say nonlinearities, I usually refer to things like ReLU or ten age, something that we use to transform the representation in nonlinearity. Softmax, in my mind, is something we use to get the notion of probability, but it is a non-linear function. Yes? So if we had this entire sentence, mm -hmm. what would be the void label against which we calculate the loss? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great point. So we do have information of what are mentions in our training data, right? So we do know exactly what is a mention, and that's our source of uh, supervision. Yeah. Um, although I'm not hundred percent how they utilize it here, I will come to to that in a second. So. Uh, co-reference resolution. I said it consists of two subtasks. We have just found a way to find a score for whether something is mentioned or not. What is our next uh, subtasks? Actually. Actually finding whether these mentions co-refer or not. So that's going to be the second part of the uh, this uh, architecture. I'm splitting this in two visualizations but this is the same neural network. So here you see we have span representation over here and mention score over here. That's, that's uh, the same span representation and mention score here. And whatever you see above mention score in the next slide is actually something you stack on top of this neural architecture. So we are talking about single ar neural architecture, not about two of them. All right. So we have a mention score for each one of our spans, and now we need to decide for every pair of uh, uh, um, of these mentions whether they are co-referring or not. And here you would actually use some thresholding to decide. Let's say again, 0.5. You will ignore every span representation that doesn't have a score above 0.5, and only consider those that have. So you're not really looking at co-reference about every single span here, just a subset of them. So we have these three, let's say all of these spans are mentioned. So we are gonna check what is called the antecedent score. So whether uh, you need to check here for this pair and for uh, for this pair. Um, I'm trying to see why don't we have, uh-huh, we do have. Um, let me just see for a moment. These errors are so confusing. There is way too many. Um, uh -huh, okay. So so here, uh, the, the point of my confusion was, okay, we have arrows uh, between these two. We are checking their co-reference and we have the co-reference between these two, but we do not have the co-reference uh, links between the first one and the third one, right? Um, I don't know. Oh, we do one. Okay. Oh no, do we have all of them? First and second is not. First and second is not. Uh, is not there. Um. Yeah, I don't know why that is. Um. Yeah, something to think about. I don't know exactly how these um how they chose which things they will check the co-reference for. Um, if they were checking every single possible span pairs, then we would expect to see also here uh, another you know, uh, pair, but we don't see, and I don't remember exactly why. So we check the uh, co-reference of some of these uh, pairs of spans, which means that we take the representation of a span over here, representation of span over here. And what they do is concatenate the representation of the first span, representation of the second span. And they also make um, element-wise product of these two vectors and concatenate the resulting vector. So it's uh, they concatenate three vectors. And then again, they need the uh, you know linear transformation plus softmax to decide or sigmoid to decide whether the what's the scores of these two spans being uh, antecedent. And then all of these scores are in the end combined into a single so-called co-reference score, where you have the score for the first uh, span being uh, mentioned, a score for the spec second span being uh, mentioned. And then you have the score for them being uh, one being antecedent of the other. Uh, and that's your final score. And uh, and uh, based on the score, you are using some kind of loss function to then uh, calculate, you know, to, to tell you whether all of this together, all of these informations were correct or not. And then gradient descent back propagate through all of uh, that. Okay. So we are at time, so we are gonna stop here. I'm sure you might have some confusion. So 
next time we start, I'm just gonna check whether these things are okay. Um, you know, you can, you really understand what has happened here. And then I do need to uh, tell you how we are gonna evaluate for reference because it's not just, you know, it's not perplexity or F1 out of shift. Okay, see you. Uh, and please watch out for my announcements about how are we gonna meet uh, next week.